All right, we're gonna wait for people to join. I am really excited for today's conversation. I will be interviewing Senator Cory Booker today. Um, this was arranged by the folks at Climate Power. And basically we wanted to have a conversation about environmental justice in honor of Earth Month. Um, so we're gonna wait a few minutes to get the conversation started. So hang in there. And the reason why we really wanted to have this conversation is because, you know, we are seeing that the clean energy industry is growing at such an exponential rate. And we realize that we need to rebuild America in a way that is promoting, um, you know, clean energy, good jobs for uh, communities all over the country. But this specifically needs to emphasize and focus on black indigenous and people of color, of course, as we talk here on Brown Girl Green. Um, and so I wanted to interview the senator to talk about uh, President Biden's uh, Build Back Better plan, um, to ask him questions about, um, you know, is justice and equity centered in this plan? And what does that actually look like? Um, uh, and also to ask him just like the other work that's happening um, on a federal government level regarding environmental justice. So we wanted to cover these topics today to really, you know, go into what the policy actually looks like, what the opportunities are for people to get involved. And um, yeah, I'm really excited to have him join today. And it's going to be a quick conversation. Um, so I'm going to try to cover as much coverage as possible. And so I'm really excited uh, that you all are joining today for today's IG Live. It'll start any moment now. And I, I just also want to add while we're waiting, um, you know, when it comes to COVID and our recovery after the pandemic, um, I just wanted to bring up that um, we're seeing that Black and Brown communities are being impacted the the hardest. And we know that with COVID-19, um, communities that already had predetermined um, health impacts are going to be hit worse and have already been hit worse uh, by the pandemic. And so we also have to think, you know, when we're rebuilding the economy um, and trying to figure out what America is going to look like after, you know, people get vaccinated and the country opens up again, how are we going to ensure that um, BIPOC communities are not left behind when talking about climate change and talking about environmental justice. So we are going to get started very soon. And for people who may um, not know me, I'm Christy, if you're new to Brown Girl Green. And um, I really love having conversations like this about environmental justice. Um, and I really wanna know that our leaders are listening and being held accountable to create a more equitable country and society as a whole. So we're gonna wait. I'm very excited. Maybe I can talk about some other stuff while we're waiting. Yay, thank you. Thanks for being so supportive, everyone. Okay, great. I'm like, I'll just keep talking. You know, I love talking. Um, you know, when it comes to environmental justice in our country today, like we have to also think about a just transition, which has been coined uh, by the leaders of the climate justice movement. Um, we have to make sure that black and brown communities are not left behind. Um, even while we're transitioning um, from the fossil fuel industry, we need to figure out, um, you know, if we are going to have uh, clean energy, how can we make sure that this new economy that's going to be centered around renewables is going to benefit um, the most marginalized in our society today? Because if we don't prioritize that, then we're going to keep replicating um, a lot of these inequities in our society. Um, and it's going to continue to create um, energy injustice. And that's why it's so important to have more people of color, um, to have a seat at the table when it comes to environmental decision making 
and we need politicians um, like Senator Cory Booker who are on our side um, to really demand for that change um, in Congress. And so I think this is also a critical part of the conversation where we need to um, think about what's at stake and um, who needs to be in the conversation. So yeah. I'm very excited. And this conversation is gonna be saved afterwards. So if you are having a really busy day, um, you can always watch the recording after it's done. Um, I wanna include a, a stat that was provided to me from Climate Power. Um, at the start of 2020, clean energy jobs employed nearly 3.4 million workers in the US three times as many workers as employed by the fossil fuel industry. Um, but COVID employment recovery numbers are skewed by race. For white workers, the unemployment rate fell to 5.6% in February, uh, below the national rate. But for Black and Latinx workers, um, there was reported jobless rates of 9.9% and 8.5%, respectively. Um, and so we're seeing, again, like I was just mentioning, if we are going to create good paying jobs that are going to promote this transition um, to addressing climate justice, we need to make sure that the people that are getting access to that um, are the ones that have been historically disinvested in. Um, and I think on top of that, I actually wrote a blog post that you all can check out um, that talks about um, the lack of diversity and inclusion in uh, clean tech and in um, addressing the energy sector. Um, and it's a really great blog um, that I did in partnership with Virtue Lab, um, where we basically dive into the research that shows that um, the clean energy sector does not look like people like me um, in roles of, you know, even the labor force or leadership or even the people that um, are investing in clean tech. Um, there's not a lot of Black, Indigenous, or people of color whatsoever. Um, and so we need to figure out like what what are the pathways to be able to bring more people um, into this sector, um, not just from a leadership standpoint, but also so that way they can encourage their communities that there's actual jobs available um, to be a part of this transition. And so um, that means, you know, low income communities, communities of color, blue collar workers um, in the working class and even those in rural areas, um, we need to make sure that people aren't being left behind. Um, so in this Build Back Better plan um, for giving people, you know, good quality jobs, um, we, we need to make sure that those people aren't left behind, um, even if we do close down, you know, coal fired power plants, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we need to make sure that, that they are included in, in the situation. Okay, great. You know, I covered all the stats that you all had, which is excellent. Um, wonderful. Okay, great. I believe I can add you now. Okay, fantastic. Hello. Hello. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Good morning to you. I'm so grateful to be on with you. Me too. Thank you so much for joining this conversation. Um, it's so nice to meet you. I'm Christy with Brown Girl Green. Uh, Christy, first of all, it's nice to meet you. Second of all, I love your Instagram uh, uh, title. Oh, it's just, it makes me, go, makes me very happy. Oh, thank you so much. Well, you know, your work makes me so happy too. So I'm so happy that you made the time in your busy schedule to join me today. Oh, thank you so, so much. You're, 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 you're overly kind. This is a movement in the nation. Every one of us has a role to play. And your voice and getting people engaged, informed and activated inspires me. This is how we win. I've been in the Senate for seven years. And everything from the healthcare legislation to the big uh, American Rescue Plan we just passed, those were possible, not because Biden or B Booker, B Biden or Booker or Harris, uh, it was possibly possible by the activism of Americans committed to these issues. So they, American people saved healthcare in America and, uh, uh, and helped us get the American Rescue Plan done. So I am thrilled to be on. This can't be our last time though. We got to hang out and chat more. 
Yes, no, this is going to be the first of many conversations. Well, you know, I know that our time is limited, so I really want to dive into environmental justice because that's why we're having this conversation on Earth Month today. Um, so my first question for you is that President Joe Biden recently unveiled the American Jobs Plan, which is focused on upgrading America's infrastructure and investing in clean energy to create millions of jobs. From your perspective and being in the Senate, how are you thinking about this moment in terms of our progress and taking action to create a clean energy economy, economy and to tackle climate change? Well, I actually want to get everybody focused on, obviously, we, we hear a lot of talk about the ur urgency of climate change, but not enough talk about the climate disasters, the, excuse me, the environmental disasters millions and millions of Americans are dealing with right now. I, I'm sitting here in the central ward of Newark, New Jersey, and I love my community. We don't mistake wealth with worth here. We are, are thriving, incredible people, but we live surrounded by toxicity, from the lead in water to the, to the heavy metals in our soil that don't allow us to plant our own gardens, to the Superfund sites, too, that are just within miles of where I'm sitting, uh, to the, all the, air, the airports, the ports, the highways intersect here that are giving my kids four times higher asthma rates than, than my kids that are in surrounding suburbs. Uh, all of these things mean that we are seeing communities of color, especially growing up around profound toxicity. And most of Americans don't know the, the level of the suffering out there. We all think about Flint, Michigan, but there are over 3,000 jurisdictions in America where children have more than twice the blood lead levels of the kids that were suffering in Flint, Michigan. And so what Joe Biden is doing with Kamala Harris uh, um, is inspiring me because I've been putting bill after bill about this uh, in, in recent years, but nothing changed. Now, Biden comes in and says, I'm going to do my uh, focus on, on climate change and the environment, and I'm going to start putting real money into alleviating environmental injustice in America. And so, for example, he's putting billions and billions of dollars into getting every lead service pipe out of this country once and for all. Why we haven't done this a generation ago makes no sense. But Joe mm -hmm. Biden is saying that the brains of the millions of children that are affected by lead every year are too precious, to have, are, are too overflowing with potential. And I'm gonna do that. And here's the second best thing about it. It not only will alleviate that toxicity, but it will create thousands and thousands of jobs, good paying, a wow. living wage plus jobs, that are really going to help us. So we get that win-win, and then we unleash the potential of brains that won't be affected by lead that can become surgical surgeons, uh, teachers, uh, 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 even even United States senators and presidents if they give are given uh, uh, a life without toxicity. That's amazing, and I think you know when it comes to environmental justice, communities are presented this false choice between good jobs and a healthy environment. So it's amazing that you all have figured out a way to be able to bridge that gap. It's so important right now. Yes, amen, amen. Amazing. And so on my podcast, Brown Girl Green, I talk a lot about creative solutions to solving the climate crisis. And so I wanna know in your view, what is the most creative tack the American Jobs Plan takes to addressing climate change and ensuring environmental justice? Well, gosh, I mean, so first of all, I love the thought that's going into this bill. There are so many aspects of it that to me are, are just creative uh, that, that there, people aren't really thinking about. And so one area that I don't think enough people think about it, and forgive me for, for showing my inner vegan, uh, um, but uh, we don't understand that agriculture is one of the most damaging aspects, uh, the overall food system rather is the most damaging aspects to our climate, but has the potential to lead us out of this crisis. Because wow. we don't only want to stop putting uh, a carbon into the air, we want to pull more of it down and sequester. Mm -hmm. And so I am so excited. I've been, again, beating this drum of that if we let our farmers, our independent family farmers lead and give them the resources to do regenerative farming, regenerative agriculture, we can, we can do a lot. So one of the things, I know we're talking a lot about electrical grids, that helps. We're talking a lot about clean energy. I, I'm, I'm a big advocate of taking away oil companies, tax credits, and giving, yes. them, <laughs> giving, them, uh, to, uh, giving them to the kind of energy, clean energy we really want. We gotta do all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But please, everybody, do not forget or underestimate how powerful it is 
um, uh, to, to, to start investing in uh, empowering farmers to do the kind of things that sequester carbon, cover crops, uh, uh, regenerative cattle raising. There's so many things that we could be doing that are, are just profound, not to mention that, that funding these farming helps to protect our rivers and streams as well. Because right now, so many of these phosphates, and I'm sorry, Americans eat billions, nine billion animals we consume every year, uh, uh, which alone drives so much of climate change. But the, how can I say this uh, um, in a way that doesn't offend? They're, they're, the excrement uh, of, uh, of these animals is flowing into our, literally the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, the size of New Jersey, the state I'm in right now, because of all this, I'll say it, shit, excuse my language, excuse my language, flowing, flowing yeah. uh, and all these chemicals that we are overusing, the phosphates we're, we're spraying on crops, um, uh, 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 pushed by Monsanto uh, and, and, and Bayer. So the, the, I've, I've, I switched to the Ag Committee in this Congress because I saw it was at the center of so many justice issues, justice for farmers, justice for farm workers and, and food workers and meatpacking plants, justice for environmental justice, uh, justice for the end consumers, because again, the way the farm systems are right now, th there's a reason why in the bodega, the corner store here, the children walk in and a Twinkie product is cheaper than an apple because most of our subsidies are going to things uh, that are making us incredibly sick. And you want to talk about environmental injustice? Food is a justice issue. And the uh, di childhood diabetes rates of, of, of Native American children have gone up 300% in just 10 years. Black children, just 10%, 20, excuse me, has gone up 200% in, in 10 years. Uh, Latino uh, children, Latinx children, 50%. This is, we are seeing the, the slow killing off of generations of Americans because of these broken food systems. And with an environmental consciousness, we can lead our way out of more than one crisis, the food crisis, uh, the farm worker crisis, the disappearance of farmers, bankruptcies, suicide rates, astonishingly high, and, and, and actually create a major sink for all the carbon in our atmosphere. Wow, I don't think enough people talk about the, the power of the agriculture sector to address these issues. So I think that's really strategic and awesome that you're doing that. Um, you know, building off of that, I know that we didn't cover this. Hold on, you live in California, by the way? Sorry? Where do you live? What state? I'm in California. I'm that's, in no, but area. where? Uh, Northern? In, in the Southern? Bay Area, Northern California, yeah. All right. I, I went to school in the Bay Area, so I, I've gotten to know Northern California well. Oh, wow. Amazing. Where did you go to school? I went to Stanford. Amazing. I went to UC Berkeley, but, you know, we won't. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Should we show our rivalry right now? I, my like, staff didn't, it's going my down staff down didn't down. tell me that. I might not have come on for crying out loud. Oh, no. <laughs> I should have got that tucked away. Oh, no. And I played football. Oh. I played football for Stanford. That's awesome. That's yeah. great. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Wow, we definitely need to connect after this. I'm like, I, I look forward to it. I a look happy hour to it. talk talk about life. Um, but I I found this article online that says that you were also fighting for the Environmental Justice Act of uh, 2021, and I did want to just have you quickly explain like what that is to people in the audience because I think it's such a cool fight. Um, and to see that you were fighting alongside it uh, really impressed me. So I'd love if you could speak on that really quickly too. No, no, I appreciate that. So I, I wrote this comprehensive bill, the first one in the Senate about environmental justice issues after running around New Jersey and seeing unacceptable environmental injustices from, we are the state with the most super fun sites. Every state has them. These are these very, very toxic sites. But then I left New Jersey and I went to a place called Cancer Alley on the Mississippi between Baton Rouge and Louisiana that the cancer clusters, I was sitting in a small black church and listening to person after person stand up and talk about the numbers of, of their family members that have died of cancer. I went to Uniontown, um, Alabama, where an area, a region where they were literally taking blacks decades ago and injecting them with syphilis just to see what would happen. But now they're injecting their town uh, with this toxic, toxic dump sites they have no say over it, the stuff being done. I went to uh, Duplin County, uh, North Carolina, where these massive corporate CAFOs, so companies like Smithsfield and Tyson's, 
uh, have totally warped the way we raise livestock in this country. And now you have these massive, what are called CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding operations, these big, big warehouses full of animals uh, that are living in, 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 in awful conditions. And all of their feces go out and into these massive lagoons. And then they spray the excrement all over uh, fields, but black people in this community live in those areas and they can no longer open their windows. They can no longer run their air conditioning. They can't put their clothing on the line or it smells like that crap. And, and again, sit, sitting with people telling me that they're prisoners in their own home, their property values have gone down. I could keep going on the places I've visited or the places that are existing where there's these extreme environmental injustices. So we work with the uh, environmental justice activists all around the country to write a bill that would empower change to happen. And so one is to stop the, the change our zoning laws, our federal approvals of all these things and, and force them to begin to take into account the cumulative impact. Because a lot of times they approve something because in and of itself, it doesn't cause a problem. But when you add it to areas like the city I'm living in, that already has the incinerator, already has the pollution from the port. Now it's, it's, the cumulative impact, it's pushing it beyond. So we dealt with that. We wanted to empower local communities to have legal standing to fight back through the courts to stop this, this kind of stuff happening. So it was a comprehensive bill to begin to turn the tables on the ability for communities to have power and control to stop these evils, evils from happening. Um, and it's something that I'm hoping we can get done. And I'm really encouraged. Uh, our new um, administrator of the EPA is an environmental justice champion. We have a president and a vice president who are conscious of these issues. After the Trump did horrible things, in fact, we're about to act in the Senate to reverse his rule that allowed more methane emissions. You want to talk about a, a, a gas that's even more harmful, harmful to, uh, to global uh, warming. Uh, um, so I just, I love where we are right now. And I want to remind people that we're only here I tell you, I, I, I have to uh, apologize to, to uh, a Wardock and Ossoff because I, every time I see him, I want to hug him <laughs> because if we didn't win those two elections and there were people all over the nation that understood that those two senators in the Senate changed the balance of power and allow us to get bills like this passed. And so those things only happen with activism, with people not viewing our democracy as a spectator sport where they just sit back and give color commentary, but actually get engaged send $5 to a candidate, uh, uh, lobby their congressperson over environmental justice issues, make themselves more knowledgeable and aware of what's going on and putting themselves out there, taking a risk, leaving your comfort zone to be an activist. That's amazing. You know, I really want you to give calls to action. So you already are ahead of the game on that. But, I, you know, I know that we only have a few minutes left, but I did want to know, like, um, with this clean energy transition and giving people jobs, like how, how do you feel this equitable transition will make sure that black and brown and indigenous communities aren't left behind in the process? I am so excited you asked that question because a lot of people hear jobs, 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 but we have a lot of work to do to make sure that, you know, when I, so let me give you, I'm sorry to bring this back, but I was mayor of the city I'm in. And, and I remember we were building our first hotel in 40 years. We were able to usher in the big, during a recession back in 08, 09, the biggest economic development period in our city in, in generations. But I said, if we're gonna build a hotel, the, the, we gotta hire people in my community so that when people are driving by that hotel, they see black and brown people that reflect the majority of our city. And it was tough. I had to have uh, good conversations with unions uh, um, and, and they were receptive uh, to make sure we created apprenticeship programs um, and found ways to get uh, uh, black folk and Latino folk, which is the majority of Newark, um, I'm hired on those sites and we had some really good wins. And so mm -hmm. here I am, this is, this is uh, an insight. So I'm in the Oval Office about a week ago and it, it was one of those moments, you know, I, I hadn't been there since Obama. And, you know, when you walk in the Oval Office, you feel the grandeur of that room. Mm -hmm. uh, and now I walk in it with uh, nine other African-Americans, they were the, the leadership of the Congressional Black Caucus. And I'm sitting on, a, on the couch, you know, uh, the chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus is next to me and then Joe Biden. And I'm just sort of like, you, you have these out of body moments where you're just like, I am the fourth black person ever elected to the United States Senate and popularly elected. And I'm, 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 I'm sitting right 
across from uh, Kamala Harris, the first black, the first Asian, first woman vice president, in a room full of black people talking to Joe Biden about these very issues. Now, when we asked that question, the question you just asked me, we, we of course wanted to know that of these millions of jobs created, are we gonna make sure that they're equitable? And that African Americans, and that women, and that Native Americans, and that Latinos, AAPI, that we see America getting these opportunities. It was a, it was a wonderful moment. And it was almost like we triggered Joe Biden. <laughs> like he was ready for it. Because yes. then he stands, <laughs> he stands up and he's like, he, he gets animated. And, and, and Joe is just like, Joe is, a, Joe is a union guy. He's like, a, he's almost like, if they're, he's the blue collar politician in America. And, and he's like, guys, he gets really, he goes, I've, I've called the unions already. And I've told them, <laughs> we're going to do apprenticeship program. We better have, you know, uh, uh, black and brown communities are too often left out of these living wage jobs. So, so I'm telling you this administration is animated on this issue in particular to make sure that women, to make sure that people of color are, are, are in these jobs as well. And, and I'm excited that they have a plan to do it. Uh, we also talked about just there's a lot of business opportunities being created. And you don't want to write bid specs for big projects in ways that don't allow emerging firms that are women run or minority run to have a chance to, to bid on them. So there's got to be an eye towards equity in everything we do. And this is, um, this is definitely a administration that I trust, first of all, that means a lot for me, because in politics, you learn to be very skeptical. Uh, um, uh, but this is one where I trust, but I'm also verifying as, as my job and according to the Constitution is have oversight over the administration. So it's something that we're going to be continuing to talk about and continue to push on. And if people who are listening like what I'm saying, then please be some of those people that are continue to ask the question. Okay, we just approved the biggest investment in our highways and roads and bridges since Eisenhower. I want to know what the plan is to make sure that there's inclusive hiring in that and that there are business opportunities being created for diversity in our country. And by the way, this isn't at one group the expense of the other. This is what we, we, we are stuck in this zero sum gain sort of uh, uh, analysis of everything. If you mm -hmm. win, I lose. That is not how society works. If, mm -hmm. Let me give you one example. If according to McKinsey, this is a, one of the biggest consulting firms in America. If, if black entrepreneurs had the same access to capital as white entrepreneurs, there's a lot of uh, uh, implicit racial bias in, in loans. Uh, if, if black entrepreneurs have the same access to capital as white entrepreneurs, our entire economy would grow by a trillion dollars. All of us benefit when our economy grows. Right now, this tax structure, the wealthiest are benefiting more. So we need to address this by creating more inclusion and creating more wealth. Um, mm -hmm. um, so so this is, this is why, why we all need to understand we are far more in this together than we realize. And when certain groups are oppressed or excluded or left out, it hurts everybody. If it's the body politic, if there's a cancer in your leg, that, mm. that putrid flesh, the decaying flesh is going to contaminate the whole body. You may think you're up here in the head, love and life, but you are going to get sick as well if we don't deal with this. So we've got to start learning more. The poverty of empathy in this country sometimes We've got to awaken a more courageous empathy in this nation. We've got to expand a greater civic grace in our policies as well as our language. Yeah, we have to make sure that the most marginalized in our society are, are brought up along with us if we're going to actually succeed at building back a better America. So I think yes. that's exactly in the tagline. Um, <laughs> yes. But um, yeah, you know, I. You know, I, I am really inspired by this as a young person of color. I, I felt a lot of pain and also a lot of skepticism around the government when it comes to leaving communities of color um, out in these kind of conversations. So to hear you say all of that, it does make me feel um, hopeful that there are, you know, politicians on our side really advocating for these things. So thank you for giving me a dose of empathy and hope today, too. Um, I really appreciate it. But as your final call to action, I would love if you have any shout outs or any other calls to action you would like the audience to leave with when it comes to, you know, learning about environmental justice and taking action. 
besides following you on Instagram, <laughs> I mean, that yes. is like, that is the place to go. Get five more of your friends to follow her because she's putting up good stuff, important stuff. I, I want everybody who's listening to me right now, do a little audit of your own social media. Is it just full of trivialities? I, I, I posted some of my vegan food today. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not against posting things that are trivial in the larger sense. Uh, um, or is it, is it just spite and anger at, at whoever it is? Those are not constructive. Uh, 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 spite isn't constructive. Anger can be very fueling and get you to do good things. But your accounts should be platforms for inspiring and engaging others. There was a researcher, not from Berkeley, but from Stanford, who actually looked at uh, good <laughs> needs. She literally studied, like, what is the impact of witnessing an act of kindness? And she found that, it, that, that they could measure, I think it goes further, but what they could measure, it, it can affect people three degrees of separation. Mm. Everybody has more power than you know about. Don't just say you're concerned about the climate. If you really are, one of the channels on your syndicated platform, if you have more than 100 followers, you are syndicating information. And the people that follow you trust you. So give them more information about the environment. You will trigger them. You will engage them. You will ignite them. Do more calls to action uh, uh, on, your, on your platforms. And, and share more content, like from my friend, <laughs> uh, who is, who is hosting this, share more content about issues that really matter. So that's my call to action. Amazing. And my last call to action is to, you know, contact your legislators about uh, environmental justice, ensuring that they take action um, and make sure that there's equitable transitions um, towards clean energy. And yeah, thank you so much, Senator. And, you are uh, awesome. Let's do this again. We've got to do know, this again. I know, we just stay in touch. Thank you and so then, much. And then if so I'm ever, out, I get out to the Bay Area a lot. We should, we, we should do an event or, or I should come to one of your events. Whatever, we gotta, we, gotta, we gotta be conspirators of love yes. in our country. No, I love it. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your Earth Month. Thank and thank you for everything. Thank you, everybody. Take care now. Bye, everyone.